There are some who say my next guest represents the future of the Democratic Party. Julian Castro, a former mayor in Texas and Secretary of Housing and Urban Development under Barack Obama, has been talked about as a future presidential candidate and was on Hillary Clinton's vice presidential shortlist in 2016. In a new book, An Unlikely Journey, Waking Up from My American Dream, Castro tells the story of how he and his twin brother Joaquin, now a U.S. congressman, both rose to national prominence. With historic midterm elections around the corner, what's his vision for the Democrats in an age of Trump? Uh, Julian Castro, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Uh, in your new book, you describe your shock at Trump's election back in uh, November 2016. And you've said that people were, quote, trying to send a message about their frustration with Washington, D.C. But don't you really mean their frustration with the people in power in Washington, D.C., which was your boss, then President Barack Obama? Well, every now and then people will throw the middle finger at Washington, D.C., and you'll have a massive change election. And there have been times when that has benefited Democrats and times when that's benefited Republicans. Um, uh, you know, we have to remember that Hillary Clinton still got 2.8 million more votes than mm -hmm. Donald Trump in that election. Yeah. And so really it was you know, concerns that certain parts of the country had more than others. And Donald Trump did a good job politically of appealing to certain folks, uh, of raising dog whistles. Yeah. Um, so, but is the, is, the, is the corollary to that that the Democrats failed to reach those people in the same way that Trump did? It was a failure on the part of the Democratic campaign well, in I 2016. Mean, you know, the, 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 the election results speak for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't win Michigan, we didn't win Ohio, we didn't win Pennsylvania. And so, of course, there was a failure there to persuade enough folks uh, that President Obama had persuaded just four years earlier. Uh, but I think overall, uh, that the Democratic message of trying to create opportunity for everybody, of making sure that folks get health care, of investing in things like brain power and education, that more people believed and believe now in that. So you don't agree with someone like Senator Bernie Sanders, who lost the Democratic uh, primary race to Hillary Clinton, who said that the Republicans didn't win in 2016, the Democrats lost, he says. That's his line. Well, I think, you know, I agree that there are ways that we can make sure that we motivate folks more to get out and vote. Mm. Um, and that anybody would acknowledge there are improvements to be made from 2016 going into 2018 and 2020. Um, what I think we can't say with the same confidence is whether with a different nominee there would have been a different result. I think that's just, I don't think you can say that. You spend a lot of time discussing immigration in your book, and you're extremely critical of Trump's uh, cruel immigration policy, of course, family separations uh, at the border, putting kids in cages. Uh, you're based in Texas. How bad is the situation right now at the border, in your view? Well, there are kind of two ways to answer that. Number one, um, Donald Trump has painted this picture of a crime-ridden border zone, uh, this place where people are, are coming across the border like crazy. And border crossings are near a 40-year low. Uh, and those border cities in my home state, at least of Texas, like El Paso and McAllen, Brownsville, a few others, are some of the safest cities for places their size in the United States. And so, you know, he's sold a lot of Americans a bill of goods with respect to the border. Mm. And then secondly, how bad is it? Well, for those kids that are sleeping in the detention centers in that Tornillo camp near El Paso that are separated from their parents, that are crying out for them every night, that are gonna be traumatized for life. It's a horrible situation. Uh, I, I consider that a, an abuse of human rights, mm. what they're doing. I consider it state-sponsored child abuse and basically kidnapping of kids from their parents. And so from that standpoint, uh, Donald Trump is an abysmal failure when it comes to treating people the way that they should be treated. So it's great to hear politicians such as yourself making some noise about what's going on. It is outrageous what's happening at the border, and you say it's state-sponsored child abuse. Isn't the problem, though, that when Democrats like yourself speak out against this, a lot of people say, well, hold on, you first have to reckon with your own record in office. President Obama was called deporter-in-chief by a lot of immigration rights groups. He deported more people from the U.S. than all of the U.S. presidents of the 20th century put together, more than 2 million people. And when unaccompanied children came to the U.S. in 2014, he didn't take kids from their parents as a policy, as Trump did, but he did put kids in detention where some of them were abused, according to recent reports. That, that reckoning has to happen, doesn't it, within the Democratic Party, with that part of the Obama record? 
Uh, I think that uh, you have to look at the totality of a record. Uh, there were also a lot of folks, progressives, Democrats, um, and I think most proudly, a lot of the dreamers, the activists who pushed the administration in 2011, 2012, 13, 14, to implement DACA and then to implement DAPA. Um, the way that President Obama uh, and the administration handled a lot of these issues was night and day compared to the Trump administration. And I think it's fair to say that the Obama administration got better and better in terms of how it dealt with the issue of immigration. That's undeniably yeah. true, and I think immigration, I can agree. But the reality is children were detained under Obama. Children ended up being abused in detention under Obama. And lots of people, innocent people, who were not convicted of major crimes, were deported. Some of them were killed after being deported. That, doesn't there need to be some expression of regret, apology from the Democrats, that if we're going to attack Trump on this, rightly so, we need to also be a bit more critical of our own record? No, I mean, I think people were critical during that time, both within the well, Democratic you, you Party. You were in the administration. Did you raise concerns? So, yeah, in the book, in fact, I talk about uh, in April of uh, 2014 uh, the fact that I said that I was not comfortable at the time with the way that the administration was handling the issue of immigration. But yeah, I mean, I think what you see do you with think the Obama administration. Do you think a future Democratic administration should pledge not to do what Trump or Obama did and put kids in detention under any circumstances? Yeah, I think that a future administration should say, we're going to find a different way to do this. Um, we're going to find a way that both, both is humane uh, and keeps families together um, and ensures that we don't inflict the kind of trauma that the Trump administration is inflicting on these kids. And then also, of course, meets the needs of border security. Uh, and we can do both of those yes. things. And one of the ways Trump is inflicting trauma is by using ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, basically as a kind of, you know, some have called it a secret police, whatever you want to call it, a Gestapo, you know, going into churches, courthouses, rounding up all sorts of people who shouldn't be rounded up. A lot of Democrats are now saying abolish ICE, including leading senators. Uh, do you support that move to abolish ICE? I support uh, figuring out how to reconstitute that division. And I know that as somebody who headed a federal agency that these divisions of the federal government get improved and get reconstituted all the time. And so to think that this division of the federal government is somehow sacrosanct yeah. uh, is just not true. And, is, uh, I'm confused. Is this, when you say reconstitute, is that ab abolition and start well, fresh? What you're talking about is that we're no longer going to have any kind of enforcement, then I would say no. You're always going to have border enforcement. Uh, however, if what you mean is, uh, are we going to have uh, the same kind of tactics, the same kind of culture, the same kind of abuses that we've seen, yeah. or even the same sort of structure that we've seen? Yeah, then just to be no, you're saying improve, but not replace. No, I'm saying that the, 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 I think that ICE can be reconfigured, reconstituted. Okay. Yeah. Um, just before we finish, you haven't exactly been shy about your own presidential aspirations. Right now, you have a Democratic field of frontrunners of some pretty big names, like Vice President, former Vice President Joe Biden, uh, Senators Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. How do you expect to break through when you have these kind of big hitters already staking out their places in the field? Well, I'm going to make a decision after November uh, as to whether I'm going to run or not. If I make a decision to run, then I don't worry about that. Uh, I believe that when I start talking to folks there in those early states and um, talking about my vision for the future of the country, uh, that I'll do great. And if it is Warren or Sanders or Biden, one thing they all have in common, all excellent politicians in different ways, is they're all white and they'll all be in their 70s. Do you think actually in 2020 the Democrats should be putting forward a person of color who is younger? I, I believe that the next nominee is going to be somebody who's the opposite of Trump. And okay. so it's going to be somebody that's trying to unite people instead of divide people, somebody that is focused on the future instead of the past, somebody that's seen as honest instead of corrupt, uh, and someone, I think, who... What about is, someone who is left enough for the Democratic base? Is that you? You've been called a pragmatist in the past. Do you think you're progressive enough for what is quite a left-wing Democratic base right now? Oh, I believe that uh, if I decide to run, that I'm going to be fine in that regard. Yeah, okay. I, I don't have a concern about that. Um, I do think that... that uh, whether the issue is health care or uh, tax policy and so forth, uh, that the next nominee is going to be somebody that captures the spirit of where we are right now as Democrats. And, and there are a number of people that are very talented that are looking at that, <clears throat> that race.
So more than anything else, whether I run or not, I'm glad that we're gonna have just a whole bunch of folks up there and a lot of people to choose from. And the question for you, what happens if you and your brother Joaquin both end up running for president one day? Because how would that work? Have you, I mean, I, I wrote a book about well, Ed Miliband, <laughs> who was a Labour leader I who ran against guys. his brother yeah. David Miliband. Didn't guys. work out so well for both brothers. I'm just wondering, do you guys have an arrangement that you're one minute older, so you'll run in 2020 and he'll try if you don't? Yeah, I don't know, I, I'm just wondering I how it works in your family. We are more like the Klitschko's than the Miliband. Okay. All right, we're not gonna fight each other. <laughs> Julian Castro, thank you for joining me on Upfront. Thanks for having me. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.